Fred Pilbro is founder and senior partner of Fred Pilbro and Partners. Prior to setting up his own practice, he was with KPF and then PLP Architecture. His work now covers a broad range of commercial, residential and cultural projects from stylish towers in Greenwich Peninsula to listed church towers in the city of London. So Fred, um, I'd like to start by talking about a scheme which seems uh, very relevant right now, and that's the, the Walthamstow, which is a, a cultural project for Waltham Forest, which won an NLA award last year. And that's about turning a, a live venue turned cinema back into a performance space. And I guess for you, it must be a very satisfying project because uh, I believe your father is Richard Pilbro, the celebrated uh, uh, lighting designer and theatre consultant. That's right, Peter. Richard's uh, uh, theatre consultant was a lighting designer, and I guess we have a little bit of theatricality flowing mm. in the family veins. I used to be myself a lighting and set designer, worked in the National Royal Court before I trained to be an architect. So the Walthamstow project's a very important one for the office. We've invested a lot in it. There was about three years in the wilderness where we were working with Mark Godfrey of Soho Theatre, looking at this extraordinary building. So it's 1929, it was the second Granada cinema, 2,700 seats. Um, and Mark had campaigned tirelessly to bring it back into use as a live performance venue. And we've been working on this concept of a thousand seat, uh, center for principally comedy, that's what Soho does, and they're going to make really what will be the new national center for comedy. But there was no money, and so for about three years we, we looked at all the available grants and how we perhaps could do enabling development as part of the scheme, um, and came up with, I think, a beautiful proposal for the interior of the building, but a big shortfall in, in cash needed to refurbish it. And Waltham Forest, Martin Essam at Waltham Forest, stepped in and said, they thought the building could be strategic for the borough's aspiration for cultural regeneration. And so they've put the money in, we're on site, and we should open for Panto 2022. Fantastic, well, I look forward to that. Um, but you're also working on a number of tall buildings with large residential schemes, as I mentioned in the Greenwich Peninsula and uh, mm -hmm. some more in Chelsea. Can, can you tell me about those? Well, I think, I, tall buildings I'm very ambiguous about. I, I remember Renzo talking at the Shard inquiry, Peter, and he said, I hate tall buildings. They are assertive and they're aggressive and they're often creating bleak conditions at their base. And so I think we, 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 we approach them with great care. And I think now we hopefully have more tools and experience about how they can contribute positively to their setting and when we do tall buildings, and they're not appropriate in every location, um, we're looking very carefully at how they can be part of an integral and coherent public realm. So I think to take the Greenwich project, which is really the first one we did when we set up the studio, we were very fortunate to win the competition. It's essentially a low rise, ground plus six story, well-defined street wall proposition where the tall building is the exception. It, it use, it's used to mark the route down from the O2 to a, a new, urban square we create and connections to the river. So I think they're there in a sort of supporting role, well designed and in the right place. I think they can allow you to increase density, to create more open space. But as I said, I think we, we're, we're skeptical of them as objects. I think they need to be good and supporting. But you, you say you're skeptical about them. And one of the reasons for a lot of people skept skepticism is about their sustainability. But, but your mm -hmm. edge building at London Bridge uh, sets new standards around that. How, how are you doing that? So you mentioned in introducing me that I was a partner at KPF and I have a long standing interest in tall building design and the contribution tall buildings can make for both sustainability and the quality of the workplace. And at KPF, I designed the Heron Tower in the city of London. And our, our interest there was about moving away from a tall building as a repetitive series of identical floors to connections that we might make between adjacent floors. So we carved a series of three story north facing atria that bring great daylight to the interior of the floor plate and they allow tenants to connect from floor to floor. The project we're doing for EDGE, I sort of think of as the next generation in that set of interests. So 
Edge Technologies, our client, are internationally renowned for pioneering work in sustainability and well-being, and they bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of passion to this project. Um, what we've delivered together is what will be London's first multi-tenant building to achieve RIAM outstanding and well platinum. And that overlap between sustainability and, and well-being, I guess, is, has guided a lot of decisions we've made on the, on the building. So I guess a bit like Heron, you can connect floors together, but whereas when in Heron, it's hardwired, everything is a series of rigid three-story packages. On Edge, we have this soft zone. So come out of the core and you're in a timber structured space and that CLT structure is very flexible. So you can open up voids and stairs on, on the, uh, uh, to make uh, adjacent floors connect. And that in a way is to respond to how the building will be used. And I kind of quite like the idea over 20 years, you'll see it change on time, you know, and different connections will be made. Um, we're designing a very thermally efficient facade and we're pioneering research into integrating photovoltaics into vision glass so that we're using the photovoltaics both as a shading element and also a way of generating electricity. And then we've been working on an intelligent ceiling system. This is something that Edge specialise in. So they're, they're pioneering about the integration of sensors. So quite often air quality is a problem in, in, in the workspace. You get rising levels of CO2. Here we have sensors, eight sensors in every light fitting, and it checks in real time how the air quality is. And if CO2 rises, you deliver more air. And the air is delivered from the floor, which itself has health and well-being benefits. You're not mixing the germs around. You can stratify the internal temperature, so that's thermally efficient. Um, and it produces a very quiet uh, environment as well. So I'm kind of interested in the way those different facets of the building are coming together. Last thing I'd say is I think the social dimension goes down into the street and the public realm. And actually, the, the, the building is on less than half the site. The rest of it, we're creating a public park. So when you come out of London Bridge Station, you're coming into a new park. It's a green space where there's not that much green. And hopefully that's some, something for the benefit of everyone around the, around the surrounding city. You mentioned photovoltaics, and uh, when you designed the Heron Tower, of course, uh, there was nothing uh, big to the south of the building, right. but then along came 100 Bishop's Gate, uh, right sort of in the shadow of the building. Uh, what impact do you know did that have on the uh, its electrical performance? It was, it was, yeah, difficult. Uh, I mean, I think oddly enough, Heron was, was pioneering in a number of ways. Again, it was probably the first multi-tenant tall building. There'd been before that Tower 42 and Sus 3, but, but when we did Heron, it was really the first one that was designed for multi multiple occupancy. And I think Peter Reese at the city encouraged us to go further. And, and the building was about 40% less energy usage than, for example, uh, previous tall buildings in the city. The, the, the photovoltaics um, performed a function of generating power and also shading the core on the south elevation. Um, and you're absolutely right. When um, uh, Alison Morrison built the building on the other side of London Wall, uh, the, the payback, which was already pretty long, wasn't ever, I think, it's never going to pay back the capital cost. Interestingly, I did 150 Bishopsgate, which is the hotel on the other side of Houndsditch when I was a partner at, at PLP. And there we had a much less dramatic uh, sustainability idea, which was to take the waste heat from Heron via two pipes under Houndsditch and feed it into the hotel. You can't see it, but it has a payback of less than 18 months. It was an absolutely spectacularly brilliant thing to do, but uh, I'm not sure anyone walking on Houndsditch would know that it's there. You're also a very keen draftsman and, and painter, and uh, I know you encourage sketching and mm. hand drawing in, in, in the office. So yeah. how do you use it in your sort of design process where so much happens these days on, on screens rather than on paper? Well, I've got to say, one of the most painful aspects of, of lockdown, Peter, is the fact that we've had to postpone our life drawing sessions that we have on a Thursday. And I'm sure I've inveigled you to come and, uh, and join us there. Uh, and we just, within the office, are very passionate about drawing. We're a kind of funny mix because we have a lot of very technically capable people. So we're sort of paint and pixel, if I can put it in those terms. And, and yeah, over lockdown, we've not been allowed to get together to, to, to paint and draw. But I do have some compensations. You're right, we use drawing a lot. In lockdown, I discovered this 
wonderful camera. I, I, I'm going to drag it into shot and probably cancel us off. Can you see this thing arriving? This amazing it's kind of good. lit thing. This is my ladybug. And it means that I can do online meetings and I sit drawing and filming myself drawing. And it's been very interesting as a process. So for example, we've been working with St. Mary's Hospital and looking at very complicated bits of the building like the trauma center and how the whole ED is planned, how ambulances arrive, how you go into triage and resus. And we sit doodling with wonderful uh, clinicians at St. Mary's saying, so you'd like it to be like that or could this relationship be like that? And you can sketch and their knowledge and your facility are in harness to delivering a better outcome. And it's the quickest way. We did it on Francis Crick when I was working on that. And, and this is the same thing and it's a lot of fun. So I'm a great believer in the kind of, I guess the, the, the intuitive interface between drawing and thinking. So it works a bit like a sort of epidioscope, does it? Because I, I remember that uh, Ted Culloden, who was a great drawer, of course, would yeah. actually give lectures live, uh, drawing what he was yeah. talking about on, and it would be projected up on the screen behind him. Yeah, yeah, no, we do. I mean, I think we do that a lot. And, and that process of conveying an idea and getting it wrong as well. I mean, I think a big part of design is making mistakes and, and actually, saying could it be that and somehow if it's a drawing it's more forgiving that you can you can put an idea out there perhaps it's going to be shot down but you can float it as an idea and that that I think is helpful and of course the obvious benefit of a drawing over a computer rendering is you can talk about what you want to talk about the idea rather than necessarily get distracted by all of the other ephemeral detail it's a kind of dialogue and, and we do use computers and we love them too but it's a uh, there's a time where there's a, it's precise that, that, that it gets you to the very heart of the idea. And clients are very impressed when you do a good drawing as well, of course, aren't they? So, uh, Fred, thank you very much uh, for you, talking to me about your practice and uh, uh, great to hear some of the things you're working on. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for inviting me on.